One big way that plants are different from animals is they have great capacity for perpetuating the genotype through vegetative reproduction. This is because plants are modular organisms. They're made of a bunch of little modules put together, repeated units that are continually added to their bodies as they grow. The growing points of plants are called meristems, and meristems make these new modules. The modules basically are new shoots, which are made up of nodes where the leaves are attached, and internodes, the spaces in between. And the three main kinds of meristems are, <clears throat> first, the apical meristem, the kind that is at the very tip of the shoot, and also the tip of the roots, because plants grow up and down from shoots and roots. An axillary meristem is that kind in the axle of a leaf, or the, like the armpit of the leaf, if you will. And from every axillary bud, a new branch can grow, a new module. Then the lateral meristems are of two kinds, intercalary, which causes stem elongation. Oops, I said two kinds, I should have said three kinds. And we have this in certain plants. The vascular cambium in plants that are dicots, which causes secondary growth, and the cork cambium that forms bark and cork in a plant with secondary growth. So looking at this diagram taken from our book, the main meristems are shown in close-up from the dotted lines from the, at the tip of the plant we have the shoot apical meristem, sometimes abbreviated SAM. And you can see the apical bud protected by the leaf primordia. And here to the right is a longitudinal section of this. The shoot apical meristem is a little round bulb or dome of tissue that at behind the tip of which new cells are always being made, and further down cells are elongating as the stem grows. And these things to the side are leaf primordia in section. The middle of the stem is where we find the, cork ca the vascular cambium inside, the vascular cylinder, and the cork cambium on the outside, providing the bark. And right here in the axils of the leaves, that's where the axillary buds are that have the potential to make a whole new shoot. And remember, of course, the root apical meristem is the other apical meristem, the ram, root apical meristem. The root apical meristem doesn't make leaf primordia, but because it has to push through the soil, it's covered by uh, an area of dead cells called the root cap that sloughs off as it pushes through the soil. So apomixis is the general term for asexual reproduction. There are two kinds of reproduction without sex. Agamospermy, which substitutes for sexual reproduction by seed. It's things like seeds are made but they're from budding of diploid tissue through a process called adventitious embryony. If you didn't know better, you'd think they're regular seeds, but they're all identical to the parent plant. And then there are many different kinds of vegetative reproduction by structures other than seeds. So apomixis, asexual reproduction, includes both of these types of vegetative reproduction. So I'm going to th go through a bunch of different types of vegetative reproduction. The first, stolons and runners, are above ground prostrate stems lying on the surface of the ground that connect little plantlets 
<clears throat> which are ramets of the same genet, that is genetically identical pieces of the same genetic individual attached by these stolons and runners. So you might see a little plant, a strawberry plant, with a runner, and then it makes other little plants along this runner. And the St. Augustine grass that grows in our yards, I'm always battling this growing into my flower beds at home, pulling it up. And walking iris, too, spreads with little plantlets on runners in this way. Then there are those specialized stems that are underground, and many irises have these kind of underground structures that are their underground stems, which may have little roots on them, but the rhizome is that underground stem that can grow and produce a new shoot each year. Irises and cannas, or flag irises, are known for these. And also bracken fern and other ferns that have only the leaves above the ground, the stem is underground as a rhizome. So both stolons or runners and rhizomes can grow in these two different ways that Jonathan Lovett Douse described clonal growth forms. Some grow in a solid rank, and he calls these phalanx growth forms. Others grow like gorillas might invade a new territory by sneaking under patches of other plants and then popping up much farther apart. So here's a photo of that underground part of the canna this big brown thing in a ginger plant, that's also a rhizome, the underground part you might eat and grate up. And you can see the roots are these fibrous, thin things coming off. So plants may have tubers, which are strongly thickened roots or shoots that are usually underground, modified for storage. And we eat a lot of these things. For example, the potato is a kind of tuber, a stem tuber. And the eyes of the potato are actually the little um, axillary buds with the potential to grow a new shoot, as you can see coming out here. So you can cut up a potato and plant these eyes and get a whole new crop. So the potato is a storage stem, but there are also storage roots, like sweet potatoes and yams. Air potato, the invasive pest plant, makes up one of these tubers above the ground that spreads this plant easily into natural areas. Another kind of cool reproductive structure, vegetative, is a bulb, which is made up of the tiny stem and thickened leaf bases of a plant. And you can see this in tulips, daffodils, and probably most familiar to all of us, an onion, which the onion grows as a plant above the ground, and the leaves are here, but the part that we eat is made up of the swollen leaf bases. And that's what you cut and cook up in dishes. In addition to the regular bulb, bulbs often produce little bulbils at the side, like a clove of garlic with many of these, or some plants do them also in the inflorescences and axils of the leaves, so they're up above the ground, probably with better potential for dispersal to a longer distance. So to the left here, we see a hyacinth bulb in the middle, the big thing, which would have roots coming off like this. But each of these little things are bulbils. And in a garlic clove, each of the, in a garlic head, each of the cloves are a bulbil. Here's a picture of the Egyptian onion inflorescence on the right with flowers. And sometimes after flowering, rather than producing seeds, they make these bulbils in the inflorescence. 
So similar looking to a bulb from the outside, but in cross-section looks different is a corm. It's just a bulb-shaped solid piece of stem like you would find in cyclamens or gladiolas or crocuses. You might be asking, what's a crocus? It's a common flower in temperate places, one of the first things to pop up in the spring. And it's crocus stamens that give the yellow color. It's one of the most expensive herbs or spices called saffron. So here are some crocus corms. The tunic is the, the brown cover. And you can see in cross-section they're solid. There are not sections of leaf base like in an onion. So some woody plants especially make suckers or sprouts coming out from the base, sometimes running a little way underground before they pop up. Cherry trees, Australian pines, casuarina. Bromeliads also can do this, like the air plants. And some other plants have roots that will make a new individual at some distance from them, the aspen trees and poplars, and many of the plants of the pine rockland, like myrcene and velvet seed, can do this as well. In some plants, the tips of branches develop adventitious roots, and they can make a new plant that way, such as the golden dewdrop. Here's an adventitious root on an apple tree. They pop out of the stem and then grow into the ground. Sometimes that's all an extra root will do. Other times it can make a whole new plant. And here's the golden dewdrop, a very beautiful plant and a good one to have in your yard. It attracts all kinds of different pollinators. But it, with this plant you can make a living hedge because the plant, the branches lean over and root into the ground, so you kind of get a walking fence. Then there are those plants that make plantlets from little plants arising from meristematic tissue around the edge of leaves, like in the mother of a thousand calanchoe, from leaf tips, like in the walking fern, asplenium. Sometimes other parts of the leaf, different Different ferns have them in the middle of the leaf, at the base of the leaf, and sometimes even in the inflorescences. We see this on some of the big monocot plants, like agaves, and of course, sometimes it's just a germinated bulbil, like what we saw in the onion inflorescence before allium. Here's a drawing of the walking fern, Camptosaurus, it used to be called, but now Asplenium rhizophyllum, the long leaflet tips developing tiny plantlets that root into the ground, and over time, up the plant can slowly walk across an area. Then there's the ability many plants have just to start a new individual from a little piece that breaks off, a leaf or a branch, it's well known you can propagate African violets from a little leaf or a piece of a leaf. Begonias also, and many of the succulent plants too. But surprisingly, pe people didn't realize this was happening a lot in wet tropical forests too. In the cloud forest, for example, um, experiments showed that Many plants, taking a branch of them and sticking it in the ground, would make a new individual genetically identical to the parent. So here are the plants I mentioned earlier. Begonias have a great variety of beautiful leaf shapes and forms, and on the bottom right, a pretty flower of an African violet. In general, vegetative reproduction is more common at high latitudes and more temperate areas closer to the poles and at high altitudes. In Lapland, with a large alpine region on the tops of mountains, 45% of the species reproduce primarily by vegetative means. And in Finland, which has typical northern forests and meadows at lower elevations, 80% of the species have capability for vegetative reproduction, probably a greater percentage than in the alpine region of Lapland, reproduced by flowers and seeds. So we can make these generalizations that 
boreal forest herbs depend very heavily on vegetative reproduction with bulbs and corms and rhizomes and other adaptations to let these little plants sprout early and get big and flower and reproduce before the canopy above them fills in and shades them out. In the tropics in general, sexual reproduction is more common than asexual, except in more extreme environments like those you might find at higher elevations. And of course, plants in the water can reproduce a lot by vegetative reproduction. Two of the major aquatic plant invasives, the water hyacinth and water lettuce, has let vegetative reproduction in these species has let them grow and proliferate even though they might not be able to reproduce the normal way. And a lot of the clogging of waterways has been found to be done by clonal growth if there aren't enough manatees around to eat them. And of course, this is a way a plant can cover more ground if it can't reproduce, even if it's sterile. A polyploid that can't reproduce sexually, it still can spread and spread. So what would be an off um, advantage of asexual reproduction, vegetative reproduction. Many of these methods give the offspring an advantage because it can develop very quickly. And it is a low-risk mechanism to spread the genotype of that individual via physiologically independent ramets, different pieces of the same thing, sort of spreading the risk of one genotype all over the whole habitat. It can also increase the longevity of an individual in things like the walking fern. The old original plant can shrivel and die, but the babies will keep living. And overall, evolutionary biologists reason that in increases the average fitness in a population because over time the clones that are most well suited to the environment will take over.